It sounds a little distorted. And we are recording now. So um, introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Jessica Mays. I am the youngest sister of Joshua Mays. What else are you? Okay, so I'm also a composer, um, overall nerd about all things science and music. And um, the, the kind of composer I am is I, I went to school um, to learn about concert music or how to write for orchestral instruments specifically. But that doesn't mean that's the only stuff that I'm interested in. I have all sorts of experience with, um, I don't know, just diving into all sorts of things that, that feel, that inspire me creatively. But mostly um, my focus is writing for orchestral instruments. And I currently work with the New York Philharmonic. I run an educational after-school creativity program that's both national and international based in New York City called the Very Young Composers Program. So basically I can reach other little composer music nerds, just like I was in the fourth and fifth grade slash middle school. It's like, hey, little Jessicas, you can write for professionals and we're gonna take you seriously and we're gonna have you dream really big. And thank you for listening. No. Now your turn. <laughs> no, I, I, I've done a couple of these, so I think they know who I am. I'm Josh. But um, yeah, in terms of big dreams, um, which I really appreciate, you know, because a big part of what I'm doing right now, um, on top of communicating to my inner children, like, let's, let's make this awesome. You know, let's really do fun, big, splashy concepts. Um, I, I want, I, I also want to, to, I, I feel like there's definitely more rewards in society for people to, to, to downplay themselves and downplay their creative creativity and the possibilities and, and even get quieter when you think you have something of value to offer, you know, especially in the arts, you know, like, mm -hmm. I, I know too many artists who get, uh, um, well, yeah, they're, they're, we're just programmed to talk shit about each other if we believe in ourselves too much, so. Yeah, that, that definitely exists in the composer world as well. Um, it's, we're a competitive, weird bunch. Um, I'm generalizing, of course, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, but yeah, I mean, one thing that made me fall in love with the program that I manage is this idea of, again, getting support creatively, from people who you look up to as mentors at an early age, and also building this, this vocabulary of self-assurance self and being able to identify exactly what it is that you want, you know? And to do that at a young age, because we start with like fourth and fifth graders, and I don't know, there's, there's a magic to childhood and just the child's brain, you're just so, open and receptive to so many things that unfortunately just with the way that we go about the world today you lose it you lose it probably around middle school high school with all that trauma of, of like trying to figure yourself out and um trying to i don't know just you're, you're suddenly aware of yourself in a way that you weren't when you were a kid when you're a kid you're just playing in the dirt and building stuff and just your everything's so fresh and ultra colorful and ultra flavorful and it's just you're living in your senses and you know like going to schools and having somebody do a flute demo and just seeing how much it like blows their minds like <laughs> it's it's really really magical to watch and I I love the idea of I mean I'm not gonna just keep talking about this specific program but this is just a part of what my life is right now. But the idea of starting early, um, celebrating that sense of wonder as a child, 
because you want them to practice the the awareness of how much of a gift that sense of wonder and that imaginative universe is and really i mean i can go on and on you know this josh about you know just our experience of consciousness as humans and just our creative capacity and there's just a lot there and a lot to be explored and a lot of that manifesting into who we are going to be as a species, whatever the next iteration of us will be. And all of that encapsulated into like seeing a child geek out over the sound of their little piece that's about a volcano exploding candy or something like that. And it's performed by all these, these adult world-class musicians who are like treating it as seriously as Beethoven. Like this is a work of art, getting them on stage, like David Geffen Hall to like an audience of thousands and everybody's like applauding you. And just for that to spark all sorts of fire inside of you at an early age. So like, you, you know, like, you know what, maybe I can raise my hand in the classroom or maybe I, I want to be a school treasurer. Maybe I want to be a scientist. Maybe like, I just want you to dream big. And yeah, there's all sorts of connectivity between this current chapter of my life and um, different ways I want to connect with that, with these truths <laughs> for the rest of my life, you know. Um, I, I love the idea of people realizing their own power. Mm. And I'm, you know, over the past few years, I've gone through so much internal transformation, um, good and, and a lot of bad, you know, like I've, I've had some really, really, really hard times. And um, it's amazing even through that, there's actually a deeper connectivity with that sense of power, you know, like even the sense of loss of self. But anyway, that's another topic. Well, I know in your, your ventures, um, when you talk about good and bad, uh, it more is just you being illuminated to the truths of what is making you up, you know, what, what, what you are made of, you know, and those are the experiences, um, conscious and unconscious that are part of you, you know, like, again, as you're refer referring to uh, children um, and them being empowered by their creativity, them um, being celebrated for the curiosity and um, as you know, I feel like a lot of conversations that I've been having of late with people um, about people have been rooted in those people with diminished inner children, you know, talking, talking, having conversation with somebody who's in their 50s and 60s, you know, and they're being so, um, well, their, their behavior speaks of a neglected childhood, you know, a person with whom they're still trying to create that sort of balance uh, with an inner child, with a past experience that they had, with a, with a lesson that they learned about themselves as being worthless, you know, and they never had a counter lesson to, to, to allow them compassion um, to, for themselves and for whatever trauma, the traumatizers, the abusers, you know, whatever they went through, you know? So yeah, it, it is so important. I find myself following Instagram accounts, you know, I think I mentioned this in a, in a previous talk, but I'm following Instagram accounts of parents, you know, and they're giving like tips on managing relationships with children, you know, with their mm. children. Yeah. And I find it's super useful because I can, turn just about everything that they talk about with being patient with with their three-year-old with their 10-year-old with their whoever and I, I feel myself being utilizing the same techniques in managing my relationship with my inner child and with my psychology you know yeah and, you know and that's that's been a big part of again this creative process working on writing Olga Ruth, developing the Olga Ruth tokens, developing the storyline of, of 
of all these complicated parts, you know, and getting ready to 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 exhibit it and broadcast it. Um, I can feel insecure, <laughs> ten year old me, you know, mm. like again learning whatever, activated by whatever lesson I learned about uh, my low self esteem, you know, and I'm pushing against that and saying you've done a lot of shit. You you you're, you're the shit, you know. You can you can trust that we're going to pull this all together and we will we'll make it work. So yeah, just to add on to your points, you know, I, I, I very much appreciate the work that you do. And I can imagine the empowered minds that are activated because of their contact with you and the program that you are um, full speed ahead in, you know, and developing further, you know, so yeah, yeah. how's, I know you, you just jumped back to New York um from being in denver and being away uh pandemic reasons you know how's how's it been back in new york um i mean similar to the the trip that i had in december where um yeah it feels like i never really left you know it's it's like i'm just back in the rhythm of things and um yeah yeah i mean what's what makes it feel even more even less like there's been that much of a lapse is i'm literally in the same block that i used to live in mm. you know every day i walk by where my old apartment is i i lived in a a six floor walk up because you know i started off in a fourth floor walk up and it's like why don't we add two more floors of stairs to have to carry groceries. Um, it was a little bit cheaper though, and the New York City prices. But yeah, my apartment is is still empty. Like it's dark all the time, and it's like uh. <laughs> the last there place is. is still empty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I noticed that the building doesn't have any places for rent too. So I, I think that there's some funkiness just with different buildings and their ability to clean spaces after I, I have no idea right now I'm making stuff up, okay. but yeah, there have been complexities from the, the pandemic anyway, walking by my old place and I, <laughs> I needed to head to the office, the, our temporary office. I, I am of course, uh, the majority of the majority of the time working remotely, but I took the route that I used to take to get to, um, the Dykeman station in the park. Um, and it's not in wood. It doesn't matter. Anyway, it, it felt like I, I was just returning back to April of 2020, which was a horrible time hmm. to be alive in New York. And it was just like, wow, yeah. But then there's also these simultaneous memories of when I first moved to this specific neighborhood and how excited I was and totally relieved because it was a major step up from the place that I was living in before on many levels. And yeah, it's just, there's this sense of layering of experiences from the past. Mm. And I, yeah, I've had a very, very busy brain. For one thing, it's just because I had just the, the the sheer volume <laughs> of stuff that has to get done this month and you know um but i think just all of the memories because i'm returning back to a place where i a lot of stuff um unfolded within me when during the the hardest period of the pandemic here so there's just there's just multiple layers but also the sense of like, everything's the same, but it's like my brain, my mind just feels very chatty mm -hmm. in a way that is not super comfortable, but there's kind of like a, a being open to the waves coming in instead of resisting it, which makes it kind of worse. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, speaking of Instagram accounts <laughs> to follow, um, my main, um, well, not my main shtick, but one of the things that I, I, I also am interested in is different self-care and 
different accounts that are all about um, depression and anxiety and mental health. Mm-hmm. And yeah, one, one thing out of this period, along with the idea of the inner child, because I, I think that's actually connected to the, the mental health conversation and the exploration of consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, um, finding again, that connectivity between all of these different experiences that I've lived through um, and how it kind of redefines or sheds light on these other interests that maybe all along I had interest in, but now I'm, I, I want to build the vocabulary and a, a deeper relationship with and a deeper understanding of what it is that that goes on with people when it comes to their own mental health journey or their own journey to find their inner child or however words you want a spiritual awakening like there's so many different ways that you can say basically the same thing Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah definitely uh what we're all trying to do is just come to terms with our experiences that brought us up to this moment and just be understood that even if you're not conscious of of what has happened to you you know like it's still stuck in you the emotional response that you've had to whatever you've gone through is always it's it's so underestimated how affected we are you know and i think that that's yeah you know so yeah Talking about, you know, like I think about your path that you've gone from, you know, like I've known you and as a as a as a student, and then you went to work for the Colorado Symphony Orchestra, and then jump from there to the New York Philharmonic, and um, there definitely is a, you know, a, a great appreciation from my point of view of watching you and watching you build your career and build your path into these very um creating very rare experiences for yourself you know there even as a student you know and and going to london Mm -hmm. going to montreal the way you did and uh working on the projects that you've worked on you know i've had uh it's it's been awesome to to watch your trajectory and i'm super excited for for what's coming up for sure um um i guess talk about that like talk about uh talk about the path of of being a a a, a young artist who suddenly just created something for herself with um the details that i've alluded to actually because i was going to bring this up anyway and then, again i don't know what you've talked about with your other guest on the joshua may show so maybe your audience has already heard this story. But anyway, so here's, here's the angle I'm going to come from in response to what you were talking about earlier about, um, you know, fighting, fighting the voices in your head, the insecurities that you have, um, you know, taking risks, like um, positive risk take, taking, positive risk taking. <laughs> um, because I, I think that you and I share that in common. I, so this is something that I've often said to people when I talk about you and I, that we're like, I can very much so sense that we're extremely related, you know? Like, I think we have a lot in common. You know, we're both very creative and long-winded and, you know, we like the mysteries to talk at length about the mysteries of the universe, you know? <laughs> And like, we, we have our own way of being quirky and we have a sense of humor about life and that, that, that we're like opposite sides of the same coin, Mm -hmm. because I think that we have very different approaches, um, as far as like how we went about our life journey journeys. So, um, I wanted to kind of talk about both of our paths because on one hand, I, I definitely have always looked up to you, Josh and, and the way that you have gone about positive life risk-taking for you, right? Even though it's not the path I would, I have taken or have, like, it, it, it's not exactly my fit. Just like what I've done, it's not exactly a fit for you. Um, 
so anyway, yeah, with, with my journey, um, yeah, I, I went to school. I went the traditional route. I, I knew I wanted to be a composer. I started off as a kid, really, really amazed by the orchestra. And I mean, I, I went to an art school, so I'm kind of jumping all over the place. So as a kid, I played the piano. I had our grandma's old spinet. That's like a smaller upright, um, permanently a quarter tone flat. Like there's nothing you can do to make it sound great. <laughs> but like that was my world and it was my orchestra. And I remember in the fifth grade, we had a field trip to the orchestra to see the Colorado Symphony or something like that. And I was just like, I can be that. Like, it just seemed like, yes, I have that ability because I go at home and I don't just practice Linus and Lucy. You know, like I was like coming up with my own little patterns, melodies. And that was like the stuff that made me excited. And to eventually make that connection that that's what a composer does. That's what composing is. I, I felt, again, I had that childhood sense of, it's not inflated ego. It's just kind of like, there's no, there's no sense of restraint within yourself. Sure. Like when you want to go with something, you just do it. Like there's no questioning. If you want to like do sloppy paint on some paper, you do it and it's amazing. And then everybody's like, well, let's put it on the refrigerator, you know? And it's just, you're just, everything is play and exploration. And I remember, um, because again, I went to an art school as a piano major being exposed to the idea of the composer and Beethoven and Debussy and eventually like Stravinsky and all these different composers. And I just, I felt like I could be that. And I, I just felt like I could be Rachmaninoff at the piano and like, I am Rachmaninoff in the making. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm not Rachmaninoff. And that, that's the thing that I had to kind of figure out is I'm not Mozart, I'm not Rachmaninoff, I'm not anybody else except for myself. And which is even more liberating. And I don't really want to be anybody else anyway. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Huh? I was about to mention the Picasso quote about, you know, imitation and you try and try and try to be like yeah. somebody else. You try and try and try to, to copy. And, and that's kid once, version me. Once you that's fail, yeah. that's when you found yourself, you know, but yeah. continue on with, with what you were saying. So I went, um, I got an undergraduate degree, a, a bachelor's in music. I got a in music composition. Uh, then I went to Montreal. I went to McGill University and I got my master's in music composition and I widened my network of composer friends and professors. And I was like, maybe I'll be a professor, who knows? Um, and then um, while I was in school, um, that's when the economy, well, actually throughout my college career, <laughs> um, the economy just went kaput. And so there was like, do you just stay in school forever? I don't know. And then I went through my first sort of life transformation. Things aren't exactly working the way I want them to go <laughs> because I graduated. I wanted to stay in Montreal. I wanted to just make a lot of Francophone babies, just like pump them out there. And that wasn't going to happen. I wasn't able to get a job in time. So I had to move back to Denver and I went through a really dark time, you know, um, sometimes life does not go as planned. And this, this, this was the first time, I'm lucky to say this, that I had really encountered an understanding of the fact that things don't always go your way, even with all of your best laid plans and efforts. Sometimes it's just not gonna work out. And um, I had always considered myself lucky and, you know, and it's just like, what on earth? Why? Like, I keep trying so hard and nothing is working out. And yeah, during my first darkest period, I was like, okay, so I need to build another ladder. And at that time, I wanted it to be with the orchestra because everything felt like it was pointing back 
to the orchestra. And I was like, Colorado Symphony, my first exposure to the orchestra. I am going to be there somehow. I, I need to make that happen. I was working every music relevant job possible. Um, and then one summer I was like, I need to physically be in the building mm -hmm. where the orchestra is at so I can talk to people who are who work in the office somehow. Because if I could just be a part of the machinery that supports the orchestra, that would be amazing. I want to get that experience. So I applied to be an usher. I applied to be an usher with a master's degree in music, totally overqualified. I was working with like a dozen seniors, people in their 70s and 80s, you know, <laughs> who had, you know, already lived life and a career and they're just doing this for fun. And I was making a minimum wage on top of like teaching and gigging and doing other stuff. But I, yeah, I did something that otherwise for a lot of people with their master's degrees, they would have felt totally beneath them. I put myself at the bottom of the barrel because I knew, I knew what it is that I, I, I was using this as a tool. Yeah. This is not, this is not a forever thing. Like I, I knew that. And I had enough self-assurance to trust what I was doing. So I wore a bow tie and had like a humiliating little vest. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I pointed people towards bathrooms and I did all the things that I did never dreamed for me. You know, I, I, I basically at the lowest point of my life at that point, just surrendered to going even lower, <laughs> but making it. In surrendering, there was kind of uh, an openness to, again, how, how can I make the best out of this situation that, again, if my professor would have seen me, you know, like it would otherwise be humiliating. I had to let go of my ego. Yeah. I had to let go of my ego. There's something to be said, you know, and I don't mean to cut you off or stop, yeah. you know, because I, I do want to have you continue. But I remember this point where you were feeling so good about, about Montreal and feeling so good about you know, what, what you had going on. I felt like Montreal broke up with me. Like it was like a relationship. And I thought like we were doing yeah. great. Yeah. We were going to get married and have kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember and, you shutting that down. I remember you back, you know, you're back in Denver with mom and dad, you yeah. know, and you're figuring it out. And there's something, yeah, I remember you, that, oh, that, that, that period of figuring it out. Um, yeah. But even like what you said about, um there's there's something really core in maintaining humility through all your experiences yeah. you know because not taking yourself so seriously that humility is ultimately the it's it it's it's like the fuel for curiosity you know like you're curious because you don't think you know it all you know you and and, and life is going to pre pre present you experiences that remind you you don't know shit <laughs> you don't know yeah. it all. You don't know it all. It, yeah. So by all means, you know, but there's there's another side of that. Like, I appreciate what you said about having, like, you knew as you were putting on that uniform um, and going into the building that you have a, you have, you will soon have a value proposition to that building. They don't know it yet, but yeah. You know that I'm going to be in this building and something is going to happen because I know about me. I, I, I know my overlaps to Rachmaninoff. I know my I know what I do and what I spend hours doing. And I, 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 I feel the I feel the vision circulating again into value propositions over and over again within me. It's just a matter of me putting myself in proximity to those potential conversations and those potential negotiations you know so I think yeah. that's something very valuable to be said about um your experience in that way so anyway keep going with what you're <laughs> calling a <laughs> symphony orchestra yeah yeah the idea of being humble enough to to really start from the beginning or start from the bottom of the from barrel a, and and yes, be yeah. Again, um, 
just to get outside of your ego in that way. And um, at the same time, you're engaging with the ego as far as like a storyline, <laughs> because mm. that I think that they're there, there, there are ways that you can utilize your storyline storyline as a tool for pointing yourself in, in the direction that you want to be in. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a practice since I was a kid. And I, again, I do think that I, I don't know if you and I have this genetically, <laughs> but I, I have the side of my brain that where I, it, it is a practice. I, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if it's a, a nature versus nurture thing. I'm going to just go with, with nurture for now, this idea of, of really finding optimism, you know, um, and just being able to trust the path that you're putting yourself on. And again, I can say this now, but I have had other experience with the dark side too, another conversation, <laughs> but um, it really is a practice, mm. this idea of, of just being able to trust your intuition, um, trust that if you put in the work um, that you can, again, manifest a, a different kind of reality for you later sure. down the line even if it doesn't totally match what you thought it was going to be, you're going to be somewhere different because change is just the fact of being alive. And it's just a fact of the universe itself. <laughs> like change is going to happen. Um, you just want to, while the wind is blowing, you want to point your, your cells in the right direction. If you get my metaphor anyway, so I I'm wearing, my vest and my black work pants and my bow tie. And I'm working with, you know, Simon and Margaret, you know, <laughs> and I'm being the best usher that I can be part-time alongside this, all this other work. And I was like, okay, on the bright side, I get to see shows that I never otherwise would have been able to afford. I'm seeing Broadway or off Broadway shows on a, every, every week, you know, I'm seeing the orchestra, which again, I wouldn't be able to afford otherwise every other week or something like that. So I'm, I'm like looking at what is the positive out of this specific chapter that's not going to last, but how can I make this awesome for me in, for the time being? And I remember being stationed by the, the Colorado Symphony offices in the lobby. There used to be this door where it would go to, this is in Betra Hall, that would go to where the <laughs> Colorado Symphony offices were at and people would come in and out and I would talk to them. I would be bold enough oh, to just like go up to them and be people, like, these people were the staff at Colorado. Yeah. Symphony. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So staff members would come out and okay. I would tell them that, you know, I love the orchestra and if there's any opportunities to intern or anything mm -hmm. like that, you know, I am here and I'm ready, you know? Sure. And I, I kept pushing, sure. you know, and eventually um, the combination of doing that plus all of that side hustle that I was doing, that wasn't really side hustle because everything was its own hustle. Mm -hmm. Like I was working like four different part-time jobs and um, with one of those jobs, I was working with educational programming with the playground ensemble. And that's where um, I learned about the Varian Composers program and immediately was like, this is such a good fit for me. Like it's everything, everything I want for little Jessica <laughs> at that time, because I was like seeing little Jessica and, and the kids that I was working with. And, um, I, I think just because of what I was going through at that time of like trying to realize dreams and the idea of working with kids and on a different scale, you're realizing projects, you know, which they get to feel like, oh, I made this. Mm -hmm. And just the essence of that flow um, at a young age, it just seemed amazing. And it's through that, that I eventually met the program founder because we had summer program programming with the Colorado Symphony. Sorry, 
we had, I, I was working with the playground. We went to Vell and that's where I met up with the Philharmonic because the Philharmonic tours during the summer. The New York Philharmonic. The New York Philharmonic, yeah. yeah. So I'm still not working with the Colorado Symphony quite yet, but I meet the program founder and like the New York Philharmonic, which is like the Mecca of very young composers. And yeah, I got to rub elbows and um, somebody from the Colorado Symphony was interested in doing, bringing back the VYC program because they had had it there a long time ago with the program founder. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that started my journey with the Colorado Symphony. Okay. And eventually that to that to that, I was like, wouldn't it be great to just do VYC as a full-time gig? Okay, let's build another ladder because I was, it was time to close the chapter with the Colorado Symphony. And building ladders has been a big part of life for me. Like, okay, how can I reframe things? How can I, when things come crumbling down and there's like the ashes, but it's not exactly the ashes, like there's still good, healthy stuff in there. You just have to find those nutrients and like, how do we grow from, from the grime and the dirt (laughs) that, that life cycles through? at times, you know, especially when you take risks, you know, like you're going to experience failure and that's okay. Like for me, that's been a part of the journey is, is being open to things not working out, but then learning how to gracefully, um, find, find your footing again. I think also being a musician helped that as well, like when I was at um, an art school, when I was at Denver School of the Arts in middle school, I had to play recitals and I had to memorize music and I messed up a ton, you know, but it didn't really matter. But, and it was, it's like I had to live through my worst fear over and over again of having to perform in front of the audience, having to do this thing that seemed really, really scary, but then prove to myself that, you know, the world doesn't end if you make some wrong notes, sometimes the audience won't even notice. You will definitely notice. How, how do you refine the skill of moving on from your mistakes or making the most out of, out of your experience? Good That's sort of is it. Like really the, the people that I know that I would call the most successful and the most who I aspire. Yeah. Part, they know they know how to they know how to execute and then let go you know like go on ahead and get this shit done and then move on to the next project you know yeah. i think I, I think about like even you know like i i just did this with mom you know and she was trying to <laughs> she was trying to script everything she was like well let me let's do this next week because i got to i got to write down my points that i want and it's just like no you know you know like I'm, I don't know if this is a quote I read or if it popped into my head, but somebody said something similar to this, but insecurity or no, um, perfection is just a hiding place for the insecure, you know? And if you're thinking that it's not going to happen because it's not perfect. So I need to find perfection before I can access this possibility. It's mm. like, no, like just go on ahead. You dive into it. You, yeah. create, you know, so in, you know, like in, yeah. Also in the story, the stories that you've been telling, you know, it makes me go back to just um, you you being programmed with strong self-esteem, you know, from the beginning that helps you push through and have dreams of getting on the moon, you know. Um, And then you go through life and you realize that trip to the moon is not very glamorous. You know, it's going to be a lot of of discovering your darkness discovering you know Mm -hmm. other people's darkness discovering all the the pitfalls all the dirt all the weird uniforms you got to put on all the (laughs) all the 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 aspects of life that just lets you know you want this thing all right we ain't gonna give it to you easy otherwise everybody Mm -hmm. would have it you know Mm -hmm. so i think that there is 
when it comes to, again, being considered of somebody watching this and extracting value from this conversation, I'm sure yeah. there's likely somebody in a dark place, you know, who something has dematerialized and they are now redefining their path. You know, mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot of value in um, letting it be known that what you're going through is a part of it all, you know, like everybody who's doing has, who has done something of true significance has gone through many periods of being reminded of humility, you know, being reminded of, again, of, you don't know as much as you think you did. So it's time, it's time to get curious. It's time to get to that curious side of the pendulum where you sit down and you're more of a student of, perspective than you are uh uh yeah i I guess extracting the the best that you can yeah i'm just listening and hanging loose you know like you were saying like just letting go to the experience and letting it teach you what it what it can yeah i mean and again maybe this is a another conversation um but I, I think it's important for me to reemphasize yet again. And I think I was saying this earlier. I mean, the, my own um, experience of myself has not been a flawless experience. I definitely struggle with perfectionism. Always, 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 you know, <laughs> like that's, there's a lot of things that I'm trying to learn and grow from. Um, yeah, I mean, the even with the idea of high self-esteem, because I guess that's one way of putting it. I guess like, as far as like the childhood lack of um, inhibition was definitely there, but I, I was, I felt incredibly awkward in my body, you know, as a teenager and um, even into college, man, like I, I, Nothing ever, there are some people that I watch online or on YouTube or on Instagram, and it's just like, they have this, this self-assured perfection, you know, that's on display. And sometimes like, especially if you're going through a dark period of struggle, um, it is also healthy to hear about, to see the imperfection, you know, and, and to see the reality of things. I think it was Jack Conti from Pomplamoose or something like that years back. Like I was really geeking out over them because I just love their creativity and and this life that they built for themselves. That's a Mm -hmm. thing. But um, I remember there's this quote that he said where it's, um, I guess Natalie Don, because they're husband and wife now, um, she she was reminiscing on the past when they were like getting all sorts of YouTube hits and you know like there's all this popularity and now they were kind of leveling off in a way not a, not in a bad way but it's just they they weren't experiencing the surge of the past and you know she was looking at all these other YouTubers and like everything seemed perfect for them and everything's working out and he said you can't compare. Um, your insides to somebody else's outsides. And that like really hit home, <laughs> yes. you know, like, because I, I think with a lot of social media and even, even with like the, the self-care mental health um, advocates that I've followed, you know, they're showing their apartments with like their candles and like, you yeah. know, like, or like their bathtubs with the rose petals. And it's just like, yeah, like seeing, seeing somebody seeing somebody in their, the realness of their humanity is so refreshing because you feel seen and heard because. But there's also, you know, like, even as you talk about looking at social media, you know, um, and viewing as you get older and you mature, you start to recognize the difference between self-esteem and the performance of self-esteem, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of people putting on a performance of self-esteem. They're, they're putting on the outfit. They're having these effects, having, have, get the ring light, get, get, have pictures with a pretty girl, you know, have 
pictures in a, in a place with palm trees, you know, all this, that, and whatever. Talk so confidently about whatever you're talking about in a way that, that says I, you know, like, again, self-esteem, the, the self-esteem that I talk to you or that I'm referring to that, that you carry um, has nothing to do with that. You know, has nothing to do with maintaining some 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 sort of performance. You know, having having self esteem within yourself that lets you know when you're going through a period of pain, psychological pain, and saying, "I deserve better than this. I need to process this in a way to where yeah where I can create better for myself." Like yeah. that is what I'm talking about. You know, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not talking about you know having I don't know, a billion dollars in Bitcoin or having, you know, a, a yacht or having. Or even with my story of like, or whatever it's. Yeah. It, so. Yeah. Even with my story of like building ladders, like there's a lot to that story. I'm not going into detail about, you sure. know, but I mean, the essence of that story is, is very true. Like I, I do believe not that I believe I, I did really work hard to, to, um, put myself on the, on the different paths that I went on. And, um, I learned a lot from the the journey, you know, I've learned because I, I've always been super ambitious and I've always really, really pushed myself too hard. And I'm actually reaching a point in life where I, I'm, having to not retract, but I'm, I'm realizing that I'm going to have to rethink what my life priorities ought to be because I've, there's this, I, I do have an addiction to working hard, you know, and I definitely really um, on many levels connect it with hustle culture and the idea of like, we're going to get there, we're going to build this, we're going to do this. And I, I think that there's a, a lot of value to that. Um, but having had my, my own journey with mental health and um, mental illness, you know, I've realized how, um, how damaging that can be as well, you know, especially when you're not establishing a, a practice of, of really living life. And I mean, like there's, there's a point where if, if you're so, if work and, um, achievement on varying degrees is, is so much of a priority you actually, and, and you're like addicted to it. Okay. So that's the thing, like where it's like, it's constantly in the background and it's just constantly cycling on all the things you, you you begin to kind of lose your sense of self because you're, you're so, um, caught up in this, this image of what you should be and how you should project yourself to the world. And especially for me as a manager and I I run a program, so I have staff and I have always put myself in this situation where I I provide the role of like caregiver, (laughs) not exactly, but it, I know what you're talking about. It's down. Yeah. There's that's, that's always been an issue with me since I was a kid where I really love to take care of other people and to make this amazing experience for them so they can actually realize their own self-worth. And, you know, even that's ingrained into the identity of the program that I run. Like I get a high from seeing that kid on stage, witnessing their own power, (laughs) you know, but what about me? You know, and like, that's, that's the wall that I hit right now is I've spent so much, so much time giving. And I, I, because it's been an addiction, I've lost the ability. I haven't lost the ability. I've forgotten how to actually receive or to, to take what it, there's giving and there's sure. taking, like, I, I just haven't been receptive, like whatever those, those pathways in my brain that were, were open to allowing myself to, to really shine a light on my, myself and my needs. It, 
I had forgotten how to practice that or to recognize that. And that's also a core element of the, the inner child as well, you know, like um, being able to, being able to open doors within yourself and um, find a sense of home within yourself. Mm. I mean, all these things, after all these years of, of building ladders in the way that I have, there is a disconnect that can happen. And I was talking earlier about what it's like being back in New York and how there's like a lot of noise that's happening. Mm -hmm. And like, I am walking through the woods, um, which is my favorite thing to do. Like I'm, I'm a bit of a hippie when it comes to nature. <laughs> like I feel very, that's where I feel grounded is out in nature, but I don't feel that anymore because my mind is so like, there's so many voices and so much chatter. I, I feel so frustrated because I'm not able to appreciate, or I, I haven't been in the practice of appreciating the moment that I'm in. And there's, there's this shocking sense of mourning that comes with being disconnected from your core in that way. So you have to, people who are listening, <laughs> you know, like finding that balance where on one hand you are learning how to build those ladders, but make sure that a part of that ladder, ladder also is you climbing towards stuff that connects with your core you know, and what makes you feel grounded and what makes you feel at home. And that I'm at a point where I have to make some choices within my life um, that are specifically targeted at, at um, feeling grounded again, you know, just Get because I feel so disconnected from, from my own body and from my own personhood and who I am. <laughs> like it's, it's a truly um, terrifying experience, you know, mm. um, but again, just like the first time where I was like, whoa, things aren't working out the way I, I designed my life to, you know, land me here, like things aren't working out. This one is a much deeper sense of that. And it's totally different. But I feel, I feel like I'm actually connecting on a path towards something that's a lot more truthful and a lot more real. And it's going to allow me to actually live my life and to actually breathe these breaths and to actually, you know, hear sounds and like, just really appreciate, you know, just how precious this life is, you know, because when you disconnect, you forget, you forget really what the purpose of of living this life is about. And it's, it is about being grounded into your senses. And cause again, we're all that child just digging in the dirt, you know, like that side of us existed where we were totally in our senses. Mm -hmm. And again, flavors were richer and color was brighter. We had that gift and it's just amazing through, you know, like depression and anxiety, like you, because there is a complete loss of self and identity and through the loss you begin to really see what it is that you're missing mm -hmm. and but it's it's just and there are different ways that you can have that without mental illness but with this like it just it makes it so you have to face the things that you're missing and you have to make adjustments like there's no choice but actually i have to do healthier things <laughs> yeah well when in in you know listening to you and remembering uh, talks with you as you're going through the things that you're detailing. I, um, I have to say, you know, like there's no, there's, there's no perfect path. There's no, you know, like, oh, yeah. like, like what, what you, what you were doing in the past was not the wrong thing that you were doing. You know, it was, yeah. it, it was what it was, like everything that we're, that we, that we, uh, every path and twist and turn is basically a balancing, you know, of our perspective towards, again, finding 
a situation where the pendulum is swinging so so widely. One thing I do appreciate about you, which I think is necessary for people, you know, especially young people who are listening, is like I appreciate that you have that you have healthy work ethic, you know, that you 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 aren't afraid of putting effort out there in order for a thing to happen, you know? And I think that there are, um, that said, <laughs> working for the sake of work, you know? Um, well, yeah, it's I, not exactly, I, I, do, yeah. I do appreciate work ethic because nothing happens without it, you know? But before that, there is a, it is important to find out your passion. It is important to find out like what, what wakes you up in the middle of the night because of the, the magic of the idea, you know, what, mm. what, what keeps you tethered to your healthy inner child digging in the dirt, you know, yeah. like being able to like that, that was the thing, you know, like I think about again, you and your work ethic and how I, I'm willing to bet at the Colorado Symphony Orchestra and the New York Philharmonic, <laughs> if there was a way of measuring work ethic, you would be the number one person. If not, if not in the top three, just knowing you and knowing how often I'm hitting you up and you're in the middle so of a Sunday afternoon, hour six of working on something i am definitely not at the top no, no so no this, <laughs> is, this is the thing this here's, here's, is, well, okay. what i'm saying what i'm saying is in my life of people that i know who who are really pushing themselves in what you know and 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 working at something you're you have very high work ethic perspective you know and i think there's there's value to that but yes i think that there is absolutely a need to to recognize you can work yourself into a room where you're totally not with yourself anymore, you know, and you recognize that your efforts are actually tied to somebody else's passion and you mm -hmm. need, you need to reel that back in, you know? So mm -hmm. I think both your work ethic, I also think like you being, uh, you're, you're in, in the Colorado, Colorado Symphony Orchestra and the New York Philharmonic, you learn how to be an, uh, an operator. You know all the pieces and moving parts in ways that uh, if, you, if you have a big ambition and a big ambitious idea, you can lay out the, yeah. the, the, the positions that can, that can execute that, you know, especially a smaller version of that. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I there was another point that I wanted to bring up that I popped that popped into my head as you were talking. But all in all, I, I like the idea of you uh, in conversations that we've been having. It sounds like ultimately you're auditing your efforts. You know, you're 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 putting a pause on things and and coming to terms of of again auditing your efforts efforts and the measurement is your happiness. Your measurement is your peace of mind. The way you measure things is feeling as you as possibly, you know, as you possibly can, you know, cause that's, that is one thing in conversations that um, you're, you're, you know, like I, I was talking to mom about this on the last, she's a very, she's a very kind person and to a certain extent, she is addicted to people pleasing as well. Yeah, I, I definitely inherit that from her. I, there are things about mom that I, I can relate with. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, yeah, I love the idea of you, of, you doing, of you doing that audit, of you coming to terms and recognizing, wait, 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 I am still and always a carrier of tremendous value. And mm. other ambitious people will activate me in their passions and I can ride, I can ride with them to a certain extent, you know, in order to learn about the path that I want to take, but ultimately I have to make sure not to lose myself for the sake yeah. of developing. Again, you, you, you communicated yourself as a very ambitious person, you know, and I think that there is, um, 
um, yeah, and, and knowing that, then you go on ahead and say, well, let's, mm. let's be selfish. Let's go on ahead and execute ambitions based upon these things that I know will communicate value, you know, and put me in a place of balance and happiness and, and peace and empowerment. Yeah. 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 I, again, I, I do (laughs) think that, um, the, the mounting culminating, um, arrival point, even though I don't think that there's ever like a thing you're done now, things are different and better, you know, like, no. I guess it's more of like the the opening my eyes yet again um, to the fact that I am a student in life and I am learning this new thing. Mm. And um, okay, let's see. Let's see. Um, I mean, using the metaphors of being a student, I, I was a student for a really long time. And so a part of that work ethic or that that culture of um working towards some sort of finite end goal is just something that's so deeply ingrained in in my experience of how you get things done um that and going into like the nonprofit sector <laughs> um there's there's a specific kind of work place culture that i've always hated mm-hmm. but um and I no patience. Again, you, you know, you know where my position is, but keep going. Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, what I'm talking about is is more, and it's probably not specific to nonprofit. This is probably just an everywhere thing um, with organizations. But the idea of um, how do I remember that? No. Yeah, you're you're working you're working all these hours and like there's almost like a bragging quality about just how sick and exhausted you are. Like, ah, yeah, I I the had to work all of Saturday. I worked all day Saturday and I have a fever and my kids are sick and I'm just but I I finished the project, you know, <laughs> or it's just like, oh, you guys go have your happy hour. I'm gonna work until 10 p.m. <laughs> on the spreadsheet. Yeah, and it's just kind of like this sense of like, I hate life, but that's the brag. Right yeah, there. It's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm so, so exhausted. Yeah. But nonprofit <laughs> sector is such a hub and a, and a vortex. Uh, there's like a martyrdom sort a of. Martyrdom, I was about to say that, of people pleasing and of generally just defining adulthood, defining successful adulthood by how, As misery. how much you can communicate how tired and stressed you are. Yeah. Right? How tired it's, are you? I think I'm more tired. I'm, I'm more tired. I'm, let me tell you my stories. Oh, no. Also, it, I just showed I, up at work and I have lice. Like, <laughs> but it's okay. No, no. Yeah, I do have a 101 degree yeah. fever, but don't worry about it. I'm going to keep working. And it's oh, like, you? Yeah, my, my tooth hurts really bad. I, I've been needing to get this tooth. And it's like falling you out. Know, you know, yeah. And and Let me I finish have this, this email. I have this. I have this tumor on the back of my head, and I've See been. Rub, I've been rubbing ibuprofen on it, and I think I'm actively perfect. giving birth right now, <laughs> and I'm two centimeters dilated. But I just, I got to get on the Zoom real yeah. quick because yeah. I, I don't want to put that on you guys. Yeah, it's it's exhausting, and I it's just. Yeah, I. On on one hand, I love the idea. Like I'm totally game for being a part of the 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 larger machine that's making uh, something really cool and awesome like right. being a part of a thing and working collaboratively i mean this is where we're kind of different sides of the same coin because again i i went the path of like being a part of a, a larger network and that that was something that excited me i wanted to learn how how all of how you make something much larger than yourself go and you're a part of that system and how do you go like manage from the top and the largest like system. how do you build going that have nothing to do with not well they're for profit you know um yeah i mean i've spoken with people I, who work in for profit who have a similar sort of work ethic sure, I, I think sure. this and is there's, contemporary there's, life there's stresses that come with that as well there's no perfect oh, yeah. section you know and in all reality like 
Like I, I, I do love the idea of, of, you know, I've mentioned this before of creating a project while I'm working with you. And it is, it is, you know, a for-profit model. It is pulling sustainability into, you know, into our perspective for the sake of, of being a resource and being a, an example, you know, setting a precedent, you know, uh, for, for my community, especially the young people's wa- watching me that, yeah, we, we don't have to dive down the path of martyring ourselves. We don't have to, pe- you know, we, we actually can have happiness and balance yeah. and sustainability. And, you know, like that's, that's really Honestly, you know, like getting to this stage of life, one of the saddest things is is seeing uh, tremendously talent talented people get to a certain stage and and burn out. Well, they're burnt out because they're playing the game of this is what adult has has to be. Yeah, this is what adult has to be. But they're also like saying, "I'm giving so much, you know, and and nobody's giving back to me and." And also like talking so much shit about anybody else that that goes in the direction of developing a business model with what they do, you know, and immediately activating the phrase sellout, calling them a sellout, you know, because they they figured things out in a way that really works. Oh, you're talking about with artists. Yeah, well, particularly with artists, you know, but yes, yeah. that, that's heavy in, in this perspective. And I think um anyway so i wanted to speak briefly you know because we, we're, we're, we're pretty deep in see and this is the thing like we always have like three hour long conversations what time is it I, yeah it's four o'clock so i wanted to speak briefly about the project that we're collaborating on and i am so hyped because it's really our first collaboration um first of many <laughs> and i want to I guess in terms of the conversation of what the project is, you know, and what it's commemorating and um, like ultimately, you know, even as we're, we're in still Black History Month, <laughs> uh, like just talking about- I guess it's, it's February. Yeah. Talking about the fact that there are, I saw a quote. Yeah, I don't know who said it, but they were mentioning that there's 47 million black people in the United States. So that means there's 47 million different expressions of blackness. Um, And yeah, like I like the idea that um, within this project, even as we were talking about it and you're mentioning Mm -hmm. uh, what it's trying to commemorate and you, you, you and me both, as much as we, identify and connect with certain issues that are part of the black experience we don't want to make our artwork about the same things we don't want our we don't want our work to just be shaped and textured and colored with this same the same mediums and the same words and the same perspective um (laughs) because that's not where progress comes from you know that's that's not where um yeah, that's not where the future lives, you know. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do portraits of, 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 <laughs> of what has come and gone, you know. I, I, I would rather again dive into my child, uh, inner child-based curiosity, you know, of where we are going and what awesomeness that we can create. Anyway, I wanted to bounce that. Yeah. Touch into that conversation that we've touched on before, but presented on this platform yeah 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 um one of the with the national symphony kennedy center cartography project yeah um we're working on that together i don't know are we so (laughs) yeah uh there was they sent me a list of questions like interview questions and i like answered all of them over like a 10 minute, you know, voice memo thing. And I sent it to them and they use like 20 seconds 
for their documentary series, which is so well done. Like, I, I think it's really beautiful. And I, I mean, really huge cool. props to Bamuti. And um, speaking of building ladders, like I, 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 don't, I think that he's a, a beautiful yeah. human being and he like, yeah, yeah like he, he has a, a passion project. He has something that he wants to do. He has a message and he, he makes things happen. And I find that really, really inspiring. Anyway, um, so yeah, one of the questions was about um, what is it like? I'm, I'm gonna misquote this. So my apologies. I've been asked this specific question so many times by different arts organizations. And it's some permutation of like, what is it like being a woman composer in a male dominated field? Or what is it like being a person of color slash black woman in a male dominated field? And like, how do you da 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 da? Because I mean, it is an interesting story. And I, I do think that, um, so here's the thing, <laughs> as an artist, the way I go about art, I'm not really cognizant in a literal way, in a, in a I'm, I'm trying to find the right words for this. I'm not composing from the perspective of I am a woman and I am black. Mm -hmm. That is just a fact of, of who I am. Um, so it's, it's just, like you were saying earlier, whatever expression of, of my experience can definitely be labeled as um, one, one little element of what is considered the black experience. There's, there's, this is a much longer conversation then because sure, sure, sure. There's, there's two different things that are um, very important here. Um, there's one where, um, okay, so we're gonna actually talk about the, the problematic, violent, long history of, uh, in America, of being black in America, of race in America, and all the different constructs, the societal racism, the slavery, you know, like there's all this, all, there's all of this really messy history that is definitely there. And there is the, like the need to actually um, embrace the, the stories and the realities of disenfranchised, marginalized communities, whether it's black, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Asian, you know, like there's all these different experiences of race, um, of gender, you know, and representation and making sure that you are making sure that that reality exists, okay? Native Americans, you know, they're, my God, you know? <laughs> Um, so there's, there is that. Sure. There's also the fact if you were to like step way back, several steps back, there's the reality that race is a human construct. Like it, it doesn't really, it, it exists in the world that we live in and it's relevant to us because we are living this experience of of it being um, this element of, 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 our, of our history and how it impacts us in our daily lives. But there's also the reality that we are all human beings and we're flawed <laughs> and um, we're, we're trying to build and grow. And we've had awful methodology for doing that. Um, and we've had really amazing ways of building things. And that's also connected to um, um, taking advantage of, of groups of people just to get the job done. Like there's this, this fact of the imperfection and the all awfulness, the awful, the dark side of humanity. Mm -hmm. Again, there's, there's light too, like there's beauty with humanity, but we, we definitely, we are not a perfect species. So I, when I am creating and I'm in my own headspace, I am just me creating whatever it is that I'm creating. Um, that said, I mean, there are other artists and musicians and composers who um, they channel their creativity through the lens of their experience of being, you know, black 
in, in the US or from whatever ethnicity or country or background and wherever their situation is. And I think that's awesome too. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I, I, I've, so I've been saying to say, myself that, yeah. that if a person meets me, you know, and they engage with me and they get to know me and somebody didn't ask them, you know, the, the top five or 10 things most interesting about me. Mm. If, especially if they aren't black, if they say he's black, yeah, correct for me to, to be offended. <laughs> That's you know? the thing, right? I've been pigeonholed <laughs> like, so many times because I, because of my gender. And I, yeah. And, and, and the I, thing I, is, I, that's harmful. But that's, but that, for, you know, like, like, and, and again, I say that because I, I, I just, yeah, I love being black. I, I, and I'm speaking, yeah. I'm speaking, I think race is yeah. bullshit, you know, and I, I yeah. know it's a, I know it's a real thing. I know that there's lots of constructions, lots of societal constructions based upon race. It's still bullshit. I think culture is, on the other hand, is so everything. Yeah, like, there's a rich if gonna, history. If there's, you're going to talk to me things. about black blackness as a culture and if you're going to talk to me about that's culture the thing. As a culture like culture is food culture yeah. is stories it's, that again it's engaging with the senses right is which is like engaging with culture. your humanity exactly absolutely like culture, culture is something that can't be assumed upon you you know yes culture is something that you have to ask somebody what did your grandma cook you know what kind yeah. of music do you listen to race mm -hmm. on the other hand is totally about assumptions it's totally about this guy just walked into the room and i dive into my assumptions based upon these categories that are in my yeah. mind, you know yeah so yeah from my point of view you know that that's a different conversation that i could dive further into but i i'm yeah. a, i'm a clear fuck race and i'm all about culture um mm. But, Cheers to that. But I'm also like I just like I said, you know, like I'm I'm not I'm not trying to um I I believe <laughs> I believe I have I have tremendously trem things tremendously more interesting about me. Value, yeah, outside of black skin color. <laughs> you know, just, just that. You it know? is it is a fact that we have beautiful brown skin, you know. Yeah. I ain't angry about that at yeah. all. Like yeah, I, I could yeah. not, I could not imagine being anything else than who I am and how yeah. I, how I look. You know? and, and the thing but, is, is the less, yeah. the less I am focused upon, you know, you know, like I, I remember hanging out with like, like, you know, pro black poets who, who would say like, stay black, stay black, black man. And I'm just like, how do I? How do I not, <laughs> you know, like, I don't think I have a choice on the matter, you know? And of course I get what they were saying. I get that they were saying, yeah. Be, yeah. be wary of experiences that would, that, you know, that would compromise that definition. But again, that definition is fluid. And again, I believe the more that I create into the direction, uh, the more that I'm less considerate of that, the more that I ultimately, the more value that I bring back to blackness as a culture, you know, the more that I go into the, into the realms of the unexpected, you know, and stretch my imagination into those places mm. where I'm stretching the imaginations of young dudes that young men and women who uh, are from my cultural perspective and yeah. they feel represented in that area, in those areas, you know? So yeah. So yeah, like I, I I appreciate I appreciate adding us adding this that to this project, you know, even even as you know, I could tell, you know, in, in conversations we're um understanding that there is um that there that there is a game plan that is being activated for the project. I I appreciate that we're both just diving into our individual perspectives and making work that just feels like, yo, I, I, I want to have a piece that says this because this is how I feel. I want to make uh, 
sounds that 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 express this aspect of my thought process i want to make imagery that expresses this aspect of my thought process so yeah oh man this is <laughs> a much longer ca- conversation because it's very complex you know sure, sure. because i and i also there's all sorts of contradictory feelings that you know so, i i i of of my experience of because it, you're absolutely right that there is the cultural element, you know, and then there's just kind of the superficial um, historic utilization of of race as a way to divide people. Um, So there is like, in the past, there are those who are treated as second class, you know, and then there are those that, you know, whiteness as being the the crowning glory of of beauty. Um, And yeah, it, it's 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 a much longer conversation. I do want to clarify what I was saying earlier about um, being pigeonholed as being damaging. <laughs> um, with organizations, especially, it gets trickier with um, organizations that are historically white and are also grappling with their own history of racism. Um, but I, it's, it's, it's just problematic and complicated. It's a much longer conversation, but, um, when I am, whether we're talking about race or gender, cause I'm a double whammy. Um, and usually I'm, I, I get these interview questions that are about what is it like being a woman composer in a male dominated field? And, you know, I can talk about that. And it's like, I, I am who I am and this is my experience. I can't really speak for all of womanhood (laughs) or all black people. Like I can just tell you, I can offer you some insights on what my specific struggles are. And again, being cognizant of the fact that there is kind of a a, a common struggle that does happen with being different in a field. Um, I, where it becomes tricky is Eventually, because of that question, I am fit in, I'm put into a box. And other people, other organizations that are operating on a, not really diving deep into who I am, but they just want something on a program. And a lot of people are kind of operating on the let's check this off the list so we can kind of feel better about how we're grappling with our historic whiteness, you know? Um, there's, there's no deep dive into my music or who I am. And I, it's very easy for me to just be programmed as that thing. And after a while, that doesn't feel great, you know, because like to your point, Josh, my experience of myself is so, so many different things outside of my gender or the color of my skin. You know, I, there's just, there's just, I'm a composer, you know, like I'm not a woman composer. I'm a composer. And um, if I'm continuously pigeonholed and continuously approached with that question, people very quickly gravitate to simplifying things and just putting me in that category. And there's, you actually, you actually encourage a certain kind of um, segregation, um, not intentional, you know, like I, I become like, that's the only gig I get is, well, let's put her on a concert with other women composers because somehow we're just this different species of creatives. Well, and also and when like, somebody is asking you a question based upon that, they are wanting, they're presenting you a vessel for a specific answer. And they're like, please pour the answer that we want from talk about your struggle and here's the thing here's the thing just doing your research and and commissioning me because you you think that you're designing a program and my um musical output my voice really fits with your program and we are creative thought partners together just like just me existing in these spaces is enough. Like you don't need to make it about (laughs) let's, let's put a spotlight on how different she is because that's the thing that you're actually trying to fight. Right. Sure. Of, of like trying to make 
this just normalized diversity, whether it be diversity with, like I, I've said this before, if you heard me think, diversity with cultural background or race or whatever, whatever, whether it be um, experience level, whether it be um, artistic approach, mm. whether it be your, like there's so, you want diversity on all categories. Like that is a healthy thing for the longevity and the building mm. some sort of future of, of any program, whether it be music, whether it be science, whether it be engineering, whether it be whatever. <laughs> The way that you further the species is is through um, a healthy amount of diversity on multiple levels because we have this capacity to have to be different and mm. to think uniquely and to project new ideas out there, you know. And yeah, yeah. Well said. Yeah, no, I, I can see myself cutting that and making a short out of it <laughs> but yes that's a that's that's a a good point to i guess begin wrapping up you know this this conversation um, and time for dinner you know mm -hmm. and yeah like i'm glad that we touched on i, I, I also want to use this to promote the project that we are contributing into you know the, the cartography with the Kennedy Center. I don't know if I'm saying all the words that are part of it. It's a, it's a very wordy title, but I like it. You yeah, know? the Cartography Project. Cartography Project. Is it by the by Kennedy Center? I am um, diving into my work session tonight to further out that imagery. I, did you see the imagery that I was that I texted over into the family group text? We don't have to look at it right now. You know, that's I not, have seen uh, what you yeah. yeah, so that's that's the response. To it's part of it. It's, it's in project. Yeah. It's in progress. So the black, the more black and white looking stuff. I don't know if you saw that. I'm developing this mandala concept. So spinning mandala concept. So stay tuned for more progressed versions of that tonight. That I'm, yeah, I have a deadline of passing them something tomorrow to look at. Um, but yeah, no, I'm super excited to be working on this with you. And again, have it be a first stage of working with you. Um, and just in general, you know, thank you for, I, like I said, you're, 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 you're the most, you're the most work ethic prone of your siblings. You, you have to realize, <laughs> you have to realize that yeah. that, that is a, <laughs> Like, <laughs> like Chris and me will, will easily attest to that, you know, but, uh, and I appreciate that you spend your time, um, talking to me and, yeah. this. you know, hopefully somebody saw something that gives them value in their perspective, you know, this is going to be edited down. Uh, Nothing happened that technically makes me think I have to edit it down. I'm gonna just post it all. So I mean, it's like a two and a half hour. It's not two and a half hours. It's like one and a half. What? hours. Well, anyway. So I appreciate I appreciate you, Josh. I love you so much. I appreciate you as well. I love you too. You know, again, um, I'll be calling. You know, sometime soon. You know, mm -hmm. I, I could probably call you right now and talk another hour, but I know you're trying to eat and wrap it up. Thank so. You. Again, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for whatever else is coming up from the both of us. You know, do you have anything else beyond the cartography project to post and say to people? I think we're wrapping this up. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, thanks so much, everybody. No and problem. yeah, hopefully we'll have some other conversations. There'll be more. All right, peace out. Wait. <laughs>